Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about IBM's initiative in quantum computing. I know I'm very excited to be in this area. Um, but one of the questions that always pops into my mind is, well, why are we actually interested in quantum computing? And people will talk about, have we reached the fundamental limits of basically classical computation? Now, I spent 15 years of my career at IBM working in the HPC arena. So we were building ever larger and larger systems. And I actually have an ancient chart that I built a long time ago uh, because we were challenged. In my tenure at IBM, we started out with about 2,000 processors. By the time I started making this chart in the mid 2000s and noticing this trend, if you look at that middle line there, that's a trend of the largest machine on the top 500 supercomputer list. We were up to around 64,000 processors. That happened to be the IBM Blue Gene Q system. Uh, but we noticed that the appetite for HPC performance was growing at 2x per year. And I kind of extrapolated out. And if you look at the fanciful upper right-hand corner, you'll say, but by 2030, where do we have to be if we want to stay on this line, this appetite for computing power? And the answer is somewhere around 2 million petaflops. It's quite a large number. Um, and given that we had hit a frequency wall on the processors, I said, well, we're probably looking at maybe 80 to 30 300 billion CPUs. My colleagues laughed at me and said, no one will be able to engineer such a thing. Um, and so we've, we continued on, but you can see that we maintained on that line. And before I came to give this talk, I said, well, where are we now? And the answer is, the Chinese have built a supercomputer system that puts us right on that line. We have not fallen off. And in fact, that particular system has 10 million processors in it. So the engineers have done a fantastic job of keeping the uh, computers on the appetite for this humongous amount of computing power that everybody's interested in. So if we haven't fallen off this curve, why are we so interested in quantum computing? Well, if I could sum it up in one single chart. <laughs> Two to the end, exponentials. All of you folks in computer science who've done computer algorithms know this is the dreaded area of NP. And just to give a, you know, a brief example of why this is so bad, I'll tell you a little story about the game of chess. <clears throat> this is a supposed story about the inventor of chess. He presented it to the emperor, and the emperor said, this is a wonderful invention. I will give you anything you want. And he says, I, don't, I want very little. I want you to put one grain of rice on the first square. When I come back the second day, I want two grains. When I come back on the third day for the third square, I want four, and so on and so forth. And the emperor said, Whoa, what a deal, just rice. And he said after a week, it wasn't too bad. He had 127 grains. But by the time we got to the end of the month, the emperor was in a world of hurts because he needed, oh, nearly a quarter million grains of rice. And obviously, this story could never finish because at the end of the chessboard, you would have enough rice to fill up all of Mount Everest. So this is an example of the power of 2 to the n. When we have problems that scale at 2 to the n, we just really can't solve them on classical computers. Because even if we had a computer that could solve a problem, say, that of scale 64, we would spend an enormous amount of money, go with the next year on that HPC curve, and all we could do is add one square to the chessboard. We couldn't double its size. We couldn't increase it by even 50% or 10%, just one lousy square. And unfortunately, or fortunately for quantum computing, there are a number of rather intriguing problems that live in this space. Classical ones such as optimization, the traveling salesman problem and such, machine learning, but also one that right now has gotten a lot of interest, um, and that is quantum chemistry. Quantum chemistry is one that I know some of the earlier clients that I was selling machines to were very interested in trying to simulate on their HPC machines, but they really struggled. And that's primarily because in order to actually simulate what happens to a molecule, you have to look at it at the electron level, and if you look at all of the various states, which just so happen to be quantum, you end up with an enormous number of states that you have to simulate. And so in this example with caffeine, as you can see, we don't stand a chance of actually simulating this particular molecule inside a classical computer. On contrast, the estimated in a quantum system is we could do it with about 160 quantum bits. So, this is where there's some really, really huge opportunities. And in fact, even with the systems we have today at IBM, which 
By comparison, we don't have anywhere close to 160 qubits today. We have publicly available systems that you can use with five qubits or 16 qubits. But even with those small machines, we've been able to do real quantum chemistry, which was published in the uh, recent article in Nature, um, <clears throat> and proven out the techniques that we can do this such that as the systems scale up, we will be ready to simulate caffeine or help out many of the other industries because these are actually multi-billion dollar questions. I mean, one example I like to use is the fertilizer industry. Um, they spend an inordinate amount of money uh, trying to produce nitrogen from various forms. Nature does a wonderful job in your compost heap and does it with very little energy. Unfortunately, that doesn't scale for us. So if we can figure out better ways of breaking nitrogen bonds and generating fertilizer, we could save an enormous amount of money and energy in the world. So what gives quantum computers their power? So we'll try and touch on this as best we can in a short time. Classical computers typically, as I mentioned, as you add more uh, <coughs> transistors to a particular chip, the scaling goes up kind of linearly. The cool thing about quantum systems is the main part of a quantum computer is what's called a quantum bit or a qubit. This holds the quantum state. But unlike a classical system, as we add qubits, we don't grow linearly. We grow exponentially. There is the potential here, if you have the proper connectivity, you have the proper qubit quality and so forth, that every time you add one qubit, your performance will double. So now, all of a sudden, we can follow that trend line of 2 to the n quite easily as we scale up our quantum systems. So there's three kind of things that I want to go over, and two on this slide, that kind of make a quantum computer different and give it some of its power. The first one is called the uncertainty principle, which deals with the fact that on a classical system, if I go in and read a bit, I get a 1, I get a 0. If I go back to it and read it again, I still get a 1 or a 0, hopefully, assuming we have good error correction and so forth. On a quantum system, on the other hand, I can't go in and read its exact state. We'll take a little bit closer look at that in a minute. But what that means is I can only get partial information out of it. And this is part of the uncertainty principle. That is primarily an annoyance to all of us in the quantum world in terms of trying to make these things work better. The really cool thing is this mind-numbing thing called entanglement. In a regular classical system, if I store a bit number one over here, a bit zero over here, they have no relationship between each other. Um, if I change the bit on the left, the bit on the right, nothing happens to it. In a quantum system, however, we can actually exploit something called entanglement. And entanglement enables us to cause a relationship to happen between two qubits. And this is part of what gives quantum systems their power. I like to give the analogy of this um, to, you know, many of us have a, a best friend that we do things with, and, you know, we almost know their answer before we ask it. Hey, you want to go out on Friday night? Absolutely. The moment that best friend gets in a relationship with somebody, somehow their answers seem to change even when that other person isn't around. Hey, you want to go out Friday night? Uh, maybe, maybe. I'm not sure. Qubits actually have some of the same characteristics. Once they're entangled, we can actually infer different things about them, and their characteristics actually change. The other aspect that is intriguing about quantum systems, and this is often labeled in my mind, because I come at this from a mathematical side, it was a math major to start, incorrectly is, that a quantum bit can be in multiple states at once, or in two states at once. Well, the problem with that analogy is a quantum bit is actually not just a one or a zero. So we have the classical bits over there on the left, which is represented by a switch, or you can think of it as north-south, whatever you want. There's lots of ways to represent that. Um, but the quantum bit actually has a much richer state space. So in this case, it's the entire surface of a sphere, or I like to think of it as being anywhere on the surface of the Earth. And we just conveniently describe a zero or a one in quantum as being either at the North Pole or being at the South Pole. Right? So if I have a classical bit, I can set it to a zero. If I try and read it, I'll get a zero. If I set it to a one, I'll also, when I read it, I get a one. We can do the exact same thing to quantum bits. In the bottom there, you can see that the blue arrow is pointing up to what would be the North Pole, defined as zero. If we read that quantum bit, I get back a zero. If it's pointing to the South Pole, I get a one. 
And if we do this over and over and over again, we get a consistent string of zeros and ones. It looks like a classical system. Now, where life gets interesting is change the quantum bit. Point its direction over to dead on the equator. Now, when we come and read the quantum bit, as I mentioned, it only gives us partial information. And the problem is when we read it, it can only answer North Pole, South Pole. So what is it going to tell us since it's pointing over to the equator? Now, if I asked a bunch of you in the room, I put you on the equator and forced you to answer, you know, are you at the North Pole or the South Pole, you would probably say, well, North Pole sometimes, South Pole the other times. Just if you wanted to be really technical about it, I'm kind of 50-50 split. And in fact, that's exactly what the quantum qubit will do. It will read out as a 1 or a 0, as we do this multiple times, in a perfectly random fashion. So from the outside, it looks totally random. Inside, it's actually in a very specific state. Right? And what's really interesting about this is we can, say, move ourselves up to here to Baltimore, which is a little bit off the equator, and now it will answer a little bit more that we're at the North Pole and less times that we're at the South Pole. But it will still answer some percentage of the time that it's at the South Pole. And so this is the notion that people kind of think, well, it's in two states at once. It's actually not. It's somewhere on its specific state space. Um, but we can use this to leverage to uh, use this much richer state space to solve problems in a much quicker amount of time. Now, I mentioned the other problem with it is you get limited information when you read it. Not only do you get limited information, but once you read a quantum bit, you've destroyed any state it had. So if I start on the equator here, I then read it. Magically, I'm now pointing, and it says I'm at the North Pole. If I go and read it again, it will always answer the North Pole. It will never answer one ever again. Similarly, if it gets read and it's a one, then it's always going to point down after that, unless you do other operations on it. The thing that gets some of the power out is if we put multiple qubits together and we put them all on the North Pole and we do multiple reads of those multiple qubits, we will actually get a uniform distribution across all of those. So we can get 25% in one of the four states here, or if we have 16 qubits, we can spread it out across all of those various states. And that's typically how most of the algorithms end up starting out their computations. So obviously, with all of this, more qubits must be better, right? Well, one of the problems is quantum computing is an analog domain, not a digital domain. So while more qubits in general, if you had error correcting qubits, would be better, currently with the way we work, adding more qubits isn't always the best use of your time and your resources. So if your error rate is very high for these analog qubits and you double the number of qubits, you may actually not increase the power of computation. So our physicists have published a paper that basically describes all the different characteristics you need to solve larger and larger problems. It includes Qubit size is one of them. It also includes the error rates that you're seeing from reading those qubits. It also includes the connectivity you have between the qubits in the machine. All of that put together gives you what we call a quantum volume, which that is the thing that IBM is targeting and proving over time. So it's a combination of number of qubits, our connectivity, as well as the error rates of our qubits. All three are vitally important. So I'll just step back and talk a little bit about the types of quantum computers. Um, the first type is the universal fault tolerant quantum computer. This is the holy grail of quantum computing. It's a quantum computer that could run forever, give you perfect calculations in a quantum world. And in fact, the vast majority of your textbooks on quantum computing, when they talk about uh, the algorithms that they're implementing, they're implementing those algorithms on a universal fault tolerant computer. Unfortunately, today, we are still a little bit away from that, because as you can see, you need quite a lot of qubits to do something useful. You need a lot of qubits for overhead for error correction. Right now, the error correction overhead is about 17 error correcting qubits to one real qubit. So it's a huge amount of overhead. So where we are today is a, what's called approximate quantum computing. And these qubits have errors, but we can mitigate those errors, as we've done in the chemistry examples. And as I said, we've done real chemistry with just 5 and 16 qubits. We actually think we can start to uh, do more than the world's largest supercomputer once we get up into around the 1,000 qubit range for quantum chemistry type problems. And then there's also another type of quantum computer out there. There's several different variations on this. This is where they're exploiting various quantum uh, aspects of materials. Uh, 
primarily to do a very specific function, such as quantum annealing and so forth. Um, they have a different set of applications. Um, you can't run general purpose quantum algorithms on those, but they also have some applications specific to optimization. So in case you were curious and you want to go home and build one, I say, well, let's give you a little instructions on how you could build your own quantum computer. Start by getting yourself a nice, really laboratory where you can put up some nice equipment, including the dilution refrigerator that you see over there on the right. We'll talk a little about that in a second. On the left-hand side, you see some racks. There are some microwave generators. Our quantum bits are set very specifically with uh, microwave pulses. And you also need, not shown in this picture, racks and racks of classical equipment that's going to drive all of this and run our cloud infrastructure. So everyone likes this because it's really kind of cool. We do set the qubits, as I mentioned, with the microwave generators. In order for IBM's qubits to work properly, they have to be kept extremely isolated. They don't like to be perturbed by any type of interference from heat energy, from mechanical disturbances, or electromagnetic interference. So we put it in a, what's called a dilution refrigerator, which gets about 100 times colder than outer space at about 20 millikelvin. Uh, we then mount the chip on the board and isolate that in a completely uh, magnetically and electrically shielded container. Now, our particular qubits are based off of Josephson junctions. They're superconducting qubits. And we use the Josephson junction to create what's called an aharmonic oscillator. This is so that we can actually detect the difference between a zero state and the one state that we're interested in, the south pole, but also differentiate that. There's actually something known as a two state and a three state if we excite the electron too far, or better known as the oh crap state. I don't want to be there. Uh, so <clears throat> you also have to have various resonators on the chips. And those resonators allow the microwave pulses to actually set the qubit into the various positions that we want and also allow the entanglement. This is not the only way you can make a qubit. Many other folks, including some of the people here, uh, here are working on photonics. Um, there's also topological qubits. There's many ways. It's great that everyone's working on different areas because if you go back and look at the history of regular classical computing, the memory technologies that were used in the 40s and 50s, we don't use any of those today. No one uses punched cards, mercury delay lines, et cetera, et cetera. So who knows where we will be in 10 to 20 years from now. But today, for IBM's purposes, these are the ones that we know how to use the best. All right, so that's probably outside of the realm of most people's you know, initiative to work at home. But how could I actually program a quantum computer? So one of the things we're trying to do, I mentioned that you know, this technology is sort of on the same vein as where we are where we're with the ENIAC and the UNIVAC, the very first computers. Um, but we really want to accelerate the adoption of quantum computing and make it available to many more people. So we're leveraging the fact that today we have this wonderful cloud infrastructure. We have a great, rich history of classical computation that we can leverage to allow people to access quantum computing and use quantum computing in a much faster and easier fashion. You no longer have to make a pilgrimage to the actual machine and into its machine room. Instead, you can access it from anywhere. So in 2016, we put up the first freely available quantum device in the quantum experience. There was a five qubit device. Um, we're coming up very soon on its two-year anniversary. Um, that machine has had remarkable reliability, especially when you consider how uh, bleeding edge the technology is. Um, and it has run a huge number of jobs and enabled a large amount of science to be done. We also have a rather large, extensive library of educational material. I know I'm blowing through things really quickly here, but there are great videos, documents, and so forth on our website that can teach you everything from quantum computing, from the history of it, how you actually program with our gate model, um, the background, and even discussion with a lot of the physicists at IBM about how we're doing, how we're working with this. And you can get a great amount of background, including with KISS-KIT, our software engineering stack. So let's just take a look at a few statistics, which is pretty amazing. I mentioned we made this five qubit computer available about two years ago. We have 75,000 users everywhere around the globe. Over two million experiments have been run successfully. But what's really cool to me is there have been 60 external papers written based off of utilizing uh, the quantum experience machines. These are papers in real journals. These are not just people writing blog posts. 
Um, so this is real science being done with a resource that's freely available to anybody here in this room. And we've had 1,500 colleges, universities, high schools even, and various private institutions leveraging this. So this has really made an impact, we feel, in folks' ability to use research and work with quantum computing. To make it even easier, you know, the original quantum experience, you basically drug gates and things on a very graphical interface, which was nice as an introduction to users. Um, but to actually write real meaningful programs was a little bit difficult and time consuming. So we've created a series of Python libraries um, called Qiskit. Um, we're coming out with support for other various languages as well. But this is a freely available open source download. You can install it on your own machine. It provides a lot of support for you to create your own quantum programs and then actually ship them off and submit them to our quantum experience machines, both the 5 qubit and the 16 qubit. So where are we going to go from here? So in 2017, last year, we announced that we are going to actually start commercializing quantum computing. And we've made it freely available for research, but we felt we were actually at the point where we were ready to have commercial clients come in and say, yes, I can get value out of this. I want to get ready for the next generation of quantum, have my industry get its algorithms all set up. So we started the IBM Q network. Um, and we now have 20 members in counting. The goal is to accelerate the research, as I mentioned, start to build up that library of commercial applications, and also serve as an educational platform to get everybody to understand what it means. We're trying to drive education down into not only the graduate level, but the undergraduate level, and even the high school level, so that kids are thinking more about, well, this is how you work with a quantum computer as opposed to a classical computer. So, we're already starting to build the quantum computer centers that are today. We actually have a vision of where we want to go. We're in the process of building even cooler looking machines like this. And you're invited to come along and join us on this journey. So Google us at IBM Quantum Experience. You can find out and, like I said, read a whole ton of information on that. You can explore the quantum experience, run your own jobs. You can use simulators. It's all freely available to anybody throughout the world. I highly encourage you to download Qiskit and try it out for yourself. Contribute to it if you're interested. Um, we're always looking for new ideas, people doing their own research. And if you're good at writing big grant proposals and get yourself a little bit of money, we invite you to join us in the IBM Q network where you can get access to even larger machines. Um, at this point, we actually have a 20 qubit machine that's up and running for our clients, which provides more capabilities than the 16 qubit machine we have. So it's We've got a lot of exciting things. I know I've blown through a lot of stuff in a short period of time. I will be around for lunch and would welcome to talk to any of you who are interested in learning more about IBM's quantum computing. So, thank you. Give me a I want to have some questions. OK. So first of all, thank you to Andrew for the talk. Uh, number two is he doesn't just speak it, he also wears it, yes. right? <laughs> Uh, but we have time for maybe two or three questions from the audience, and we have a microphone right there. I see a hand up. And introduce yourself for a second for the audience and for our speaker. Really enjoyed your really enjoyed your talk. A lot of information, very little time, which is always hard to do. Can you? Are there use cases where where quantum computing is less efficient than conventional computing? Specific use cases. That's an interesting question. Um, quantum computing is proven to be polynomially equivalent to classical. So theoretically, up to a polynomial time transformation, it's going to be as efficient. Now, diving under your question, there's the computer science answer to that, which is the polynomial time, and yes, it's all the same. The practical matter is today, say five qubits, I can simulate that. If you're talking about the comparison of how long it takes to actually run it, I can simulate five qubits on my cell phone. It's not a problem. I, I omitted the chart on simulation. Um, but once I get to 10 qubits or 32 qubits, it starts to become a problem. We actually offer a 32 qubit simulator in the cloud for free. Um, the problem with that one is we have to be careful on the access because a single run of that takes five to 10 minutes on a reasonably good sized server and take 64 gigabytes of RAM. The moment, once again, it all doubles, you add each of these qubits, then all of a sudden the time blows up. 
So at this point, with the smaller problems, you're right. From a beating out a classical computer, which has been in the news about quantum supremacy, you're not going to do it. But as soon as we get up into the 50 qubit range, life becomes very difficult to actually simulate. And then at that point, it's going to become more efficient in its terms of time to solution. Yeah. I have a question up on the mic. Good morning. Uh, I'm Ajinkya Borle. I'm a PhD student here. Uh, so Qiskit is made by IBM for IBM machines, right? Correct. So Rigetti has their own API, and I think INQ will also have its own API. Yep. So is there, a, is there a plan to maybe standardize the APIs because otherwise the programmers will you know, have to learn a lot of APIs for different machines and you know, yes. go about Thanks. So we would love to standardize the APIs. I'm sure Rigetti would. So I have to get up here and say, we would love it if they would support ours, and they would probably love it if we would support theirs. Um, Obviously, that's something that we're going to have to work toward in the future. I mean, because we all know that open standards leads to a lot faster development. So um, I, I can't reveal too much, but we are working on new generations of this. We're trying to standardize the interface. We're trying to standardize some of the lower level interfaces. And we're hoping to get those standards into wider adoption. So that then, yes, you could basically use one development platform and say, I want to go to Rigetti. I want to go to Google. I want to go to Microsoft. I want to go to Intel. I want to go to IBM. Um, and I, I think that would be a good area where we need to go to. We have one more question. Right with Milt right up front. My name is uh, Milt Halem. Mm -hmm. um, you indicated that you had about 75,000 users of the five qubit system, mm -hmm. and presumably that will grow as you get to the next uh, public system. Yep. How long does the typical average problem take on the computer? So the, the typical average run on the system right now actually takes somewhere in the neighborhood, it, it varies between five seconds and a minute or two. It's actually not, it's not terribly long. It takes longer to load it up, right? Uh, well, actually, that part of my team's job is, I mean, it doesn't take that long to load it up, but we're trying to actually improve the throughputs of the machines a, a bit. Is that the actual compute time, or is that the, That's the compute time. transfer of data from the machine out to the user? So there's actually very little time in terms of transferring the data back out to the user. The amount of data that comes back is pretty insignificant in terms of latency there. So the vast majority of that time is actually spent generating microwave waveforms, executing on the processor, and that's, that's it. Um, but we're working on trying to actually shorten that. Because today, you can basically run about 100 gates total depth. And our gate time is, well, in the 100 to 200 nanosecond range. But right now, we have to wait for the qubit to relax to the zero state. So we, we wait about five milliseconds for that. So if you do 1,000 uh, what we call shots in your experiment, you're looking at five seconds of actual runtime, and there's other overheads involved and so forth in actually getting onto the machine. But that's why I say it's somewhere between five seconds. Some of the other jobs that can be more complicated, we allow you to pack more circuits into a single execution if you'd like. And so then they can take a minute or two minutes to run. But that's typically the short, you know, short amount of time. I will say that the queue depth for access to the five qubit and the 16 qubit machine can get quite long. Um, but we have started up programs for research universities and so forth that we partner with that allows you to get priority access. Thank you very much, Andrew, You're both welcome. for a really fascinating look ahead yes. and what we can do already, mm -hmm. and for also answering our questions. Yeah. So really, My thank pleasure. you for, My and, pleasure. and again, uh, help me thank uh, Andrew for, for his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.